watchers, and welcome to the new era because it is the Wisco Movie Podcast. Wisco Movie Watchers Podcast. I can't even get the goddamn intro right because it's that goddamn good. Now, on today's episode, you have us as your lovely host, your boy Evan Davies, and our favorite internet bold man, Dylan Davies, is here to aid us in some movie opinions here. Today, we are returning to our cult classic series from our former show, The Onetta Movie Show. And we are covering one of the greatest comedies of all time, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is an utter favorite for both of us. Still an initial thoughts going into mo- this movie. How are you feeling about it? Love it. Always love it. <laughs> um, actually, one of the weird things about this movie is uh, how it was introduced to I don't know about you, but to me, was um, kind of like one of those weird tertiary friends that we had in the group, Jack Olson. Yeah, that's how, that's how we both watched it, yeah. Yeah, like one of those people in your life that like never quite made it to friend, but was somehow always surrounding your life. Yeah. No, one he, of those weird people. Like, I would say Jack and I were... Friends, but not friends. Yeah, it was a very strange tertiary level. Like yeah. he was actually friends with our friend. Has, yeah, yeah. I think everyone has those kind of weird outer friendship people. Yeah, um, but yeah, I remember watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail for the first time at I believe his birthday party, which I was just like, oh, okay. I remember rolling on the ground, dying, laughing during this film. So. It clearly made an impression on me, and then every time I've gone back and watched it, I often wonder. There's just a weird place it has in my head where I'm like, does it hold up in my head? Is it still what I remember it to be? Is it still... And it still has that. Yeah, and that's the thing that... the, The magic that it has is, like, we saw it when you must have been 12, maybe. Yeah. So I would have... I would have been like 10. And if we found it funny then, but we also find it funny now, that's not often that a movie can do that. No, not at all. And that's, that's like one of the, one of the weird things about it is like the physical humor is broad enough for a child to laugh at, but then also ridiculous enough that it's still funny to adults. Yes. I also think it's so layered. That's the best way that for me to describe it. It's such a layered comedic film in which there's the outward humor. Then you have dialogue based humor that accompanies the physical humor. Then you have these understated bits that you get most of the time. And then you have these really long standing callback jokes that you have to be paying attention Mm -hmm. for. There's like four layers to this film. And it's yeah, comedic you have approach. Like, yeah, you have like through line jokes throughout the whole thing. Yeah, and they're just so impressive to watch. Uh, you know, we we covered this a little bit in a in the conversation for recording. I watched to watch this film as part of the cult classics. I watched this movie twice because I fell asleep during the first one because I was just Sunday night after football. I'm doing all my notes and I'm like, oh, you know, I I can do this. I can do this. Meanwhile, I'm prepping for the first Monday show of the football history. I've been doing nonstop graphics and everything, because if you are a regular PT creative watcher or viewer, you've noticed all of our graphics have changed. All of our Everything's changing. It's been brutal. And I was like, oh, I can still watch Monty Python. And I fell asleep, so, like, right after the scene. By the way, spoilers alert. But... Right after the scene in which Lancelot goes to say, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you need a spoiler alert for this movie. No, but I always do it just because it, we are part of a generation that somehow believes they are entitled to not knowing that. I just no, I just think it's funny to have spoiler alert for something that has pretty much no story at no, all. No, no, it, it's it's the. It's the humor basis of it, too. But yeah, it, it, I usually do that for older movies a lot. 
because of the entitlement, frankly, that our generation and the generation yeah. that's, you know, even behind us now uh, or in front of us now in which like everything has to be perfectly protected or they're like, oh, I already know. And you're like, motherfucker, it's 50 years old. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's not. Which is also a crazy thing about this. Yeah, and and what's insane is there are scenes where you're like, oh, that looks pretty good for a movie from 75. And then there's a couple scenes where you're like, huh, we didn't clean that one up yet, boys, did we? <laughs> so yeah. it's incredibly uh, interesting to which, see. Just to jump off that, the little bit of research I did, um, so it was had a budget of 175,000 pounds at the time. So it's about four hundred thousand dollars so not much no it's a pretty low budget movie even at the time um it made 200 i mean 2.5 million dollars so relatively profitable but not like a huge hit or anything which makes sense for such a irreverent comedy oh it's out there it's so by itself it's it's a one of one you cannot you cannot ever duplicate it you can't copy it and make yeah. it it's a one of one yeah and then um i also looked up some of the castles that they shot at because they're all in scotland yeah and it was really yeah it was really fun to like look at the pictures of them and then match them up with the the places that they shot in the movie yeah it was I th- really interesting i think what's so interesting about this film is um I had this thought the entire time is this is such an efficient scheduled film where it's very much small crew you can tell it's small crew small cast they're oh, re- yeah. they're reusing the same actors constantly for comedic effect we we get it flying circus monty python it it is a troupe of actors essentially all being you know growing up together and this is kind of their masterpiece, um, even though it's also their coming out party. It's a, it's a strange, you know, all due yeah. respect to the other Monty Python projects, because they're all good. But this is clearly their calling card. This is the this is the piece of cinema that they made that gets everyone to go back and go, God, they were brilliant. God, they were good. Yeah, I know um, Life of Brian always gets a lot of love, but. For some reason, that's never worked as much for me as Holy Grail has. Yeah, it's the same deal for me. I, I I can see why Life of Brian might be a little bit more interesting for others, uh, but it just doesn't hold that. It doesn't hold the same weight that Holy Grail does, and I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a bias of oh, you saw it as a child, and because you and I are both honest, we love movies that yeah. absolutely suck. But we can tell you, like, oh, they're they're not good, but we love them because. No, I I I still like Master of Disguise. I, I was gonna say we're we're about to do we're about to do the Oscars review, um, do an Oscars review episode essentially, and you know we're gonna give our favorite movie of each year, and during an Oscar level quality film, I'm gonna be bringing up Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, like so, like. like Trust me, we get it. It's not always about quality for us. Um, it's about how how does the film touch you? How does it impact you? And Life of Brian, I, I've wanted to, I want another experience like Holy Grail, and it just exactly. it doesn't come through that way. And it's not for it's not for a lack of quality. It just doesn't hit the same. Um, and I think that's one of the most interesting things about this movie is. It's made with such heart and it's made so earnestly about just taking the piss out of everything. And I think it all goes back to how efficient this movie is. It's just like, let's just shoot four or five people. Anyone else who's in the shot kind of doesn't matter. Yes, there are other actors, but we're really worried about six people constantly playing parts. And enjoying yeah. themselves. And it, this is more... This feels like if SNL said, why don't, what if we made a narrative, but we just shot it like 
a sketch comedy show. That's yeah. that's what this feels like. Well, this is exactly. It's like if SNL made a made a comedy skit movie, but it actually is real deal, like filmmaking in it. Yeah. Like I, I wrote down. There's some real, like, actual interesting cinematography going on. Like the opening, yes. the opening when uh, Arthur's talking to the guy up on the ballast of the castle yeah like it's like straight up pretty much directly like uh, like straight up at the sky yeah. almost the shot it's crazy it, it, no it's, one would film it like that it, it's such a unique take of a film i think that is what is so important and the uniqueness we're gonna get into cinematography a lot because i think the cinematography is one of the greatest aids this film has um, but you start off the bat knowing this is a different film from the opening credits. <laughs> like it's just so yeah. z- zany and stupid and weird and fun and enjoyable. Where we were talking about this prior as well. I think opening credit sequences, and you said it best at one time, in which they used to just be title cards. So they were. Yeah. They were pretty boring, so to speak. Where I always find that really endearing, especially when I go back and watch Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula, you know, mm-hmm. the, that level of those older films from from the 30s and the 40s that that's just the way movies were made and it I always find it to be this ro- I find it to be very romantic period in which it it engrosses yeah. you in the story very quickly, but the mo- majority of our age group and younger and even older than us can't handle that. They just think it's well super yeah. boring. Especially when you get to the because you have like the you have different periods of opening credits. Because you have the like the thirties to the seventies really, where you have just pretty much yeah, title cards. But then in the eighties you start getting like kind of interesting where they're trying to start telling the story during the opening credits. Like the perfect example I think is Back to the Future, where they're showing the Doc's whole setup of his home. Yeah. And his little uh his little doohickeys, mm-hmm. his machines. Um little while do-hickeys. the opening credits are Yeah. While they're all um while the opening credits are going by. Yeah. So they're trying to tell a story within that. It's much more efficient, but I understand why people don't like the previous version of it. Yeah, I, I think the the one that comes up for me in a, in like an interesting blend of old school and new school is I love the opening title sequence to the original Tim Burton Batman because it's just going around this weird stone maze of a cutout of the bat symbol, but you have the music, it's taking you through a ride, the camera work speeds up a little bit as the music speeds up, and you're still getting opening credits, but it's setting an atmosphere. Yeah. Ironically enough, with title cards and just written dumb jokes, this movie does that. And it succeeds yes. to just I mean, get you there. Yeah, and there's like ten different jokes inside the opening credits alone. And I, I I looked it up when um, they actually ended. It's three minutes and thirty seconds in, and for them to pull it off, it's pretty crazy. Right. I I, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoy the credit sequence because every time I remember just going like, "Oh my god, this long ass title sequence!" And I knew there were jokes in them, but I've never really sat and read them. And yeah. And I was like, oh, this is really... And they're telling miniature stories inside... They're telling stories about miniature stories about miniature stories in the fucking credits. Mm -hmm. And it immediately sets up that, oh, this this movie is not serious whatsoever. Yeah. Tremendous. Like, they're talking about firing people and then firing people that fired the people. (laughs) They're talking about a woman carving her initials into a moose. (laughs) Like, it makes no sense. 
And I, I love it goes down to the last credit where they have ten jokes about llamas and then the two actual directors of the film. <laughs> it's like, what the mm-hmm. fuck? Uh, and it immediately sets up that no one's sacred, no one's safe, we're all up to be made fun of or be or creating yeah. humor from our our actions, our appearances, our dialogue. It's tremendous. And it's so yeah, funny. And uh, as soon as the movie was done, I looked up a video on YouTube. It was like a some kind of British TV behind the scenes kind of thing. And they must have been friends with the Mon <laughs> Python guys because like the interviewer was like sitting on people's laps and stuff. So he was obviously very comfortable with them. <laughs> but um, I, I think it was, I can't remember which one it was, but the quote was, there's no mutual respect within the, within the Python group. Like no one respects each other. <laughs> Everyone's taking the piss out of everyone. <laughs> and it's fantastic. That's like such a British idea of like, no, you're not better than me. You're better than no one. Yeah. You're the same. You're the same as me. You're not special. You're not sacred. Um, and I think yeah. that's, I think that's such a, you could tell that this was a collaborative effort. Now, give give credit to the directors, obviously. They're part of the troupe. Um, you had an interesting nugget about them that I want you to share. Oh, yeah. they. This is their first time directing a feature before they had only done the TV show. And during that um, interview section, Terry Gilliam is just fucking crazy. Like... <laughs> shocking he, he, it's really yeah it's really weird because he's i think he's american and he's just this american in the middle of all this these british people and he is so energetic and so like and he seems like he's from the 80s where everyone's cracked up on cocaine like he is so cranked up it's so funny to see him in the middle of all these british people who are just like nonchalant and then he's just like going off the walls um it's an interesting vibe certainly but but it's i can see why the python people liked him because he is like the exact opposite of them it's a balance you need that you need the it's the classic you need the for every kramer you need a jerry seinfeld you need the straight man to set up the insanity That's a very good comparison, actually. Uh, you need that. You need that middle view. I mean, if we're going to put it even in our terms, it's Keenan and Kel. You need Keenan so Kel works. <laughs> Otherwise, Kel is just yeah. kind of out there by himself, being wild, and, yeah. he, and he's amusing, but he doesn't have someone to reel him in. Um, and then the best is really when the straight man is also ridiculous. But they do it in such a weird, small, confined area where they have their own quirks and insanity, but they appear outwardly normal for the most part. And then the outwardly crazy person has a lot of redeeming qualities, but they're outwardly crazy. Um, yes. And you yeah. can tell a lot of them have that balance with each other. I, I think it's so much fun. And who funded this movie? That was another interesting nugget you shared. Oh, yeah. um, So it was partially funded by Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and Genesis. (laughs) So they were such big fans of Monty Python that they gave money from their proceeds to the Python guys. That's fucking rad. That's... I mean, that's... That's putting your money where your mouth is. Exactly. Like, that's what artists should be doing. Like, giving stuff to giving money that you made to things you find interesting and actually enjoy. Yeah. I think like, that's... People don't do that enough. No, it, it it's sad because it's sad when you see people get to this place of fame and fortune and it's either like dragon hoarding where they just get as much as possible and it just stays in this cave of this cave of numbers known as a bank account. Or they're doing all these interesting projects, but none of them are actually fueling something that you believe in. 
or, or something that you feel yeah. is, is real. Like I, I always look at an example as someone who has, has the product. So I'm not shitting on the product, but I look at like the rock he's invested in so many different projects now, but none of them feel outside of his, outside of his tequila, which I could kind of get with the image that he's created. Like he has a skincare line for men. <laughs> like that doesn't yeah. scream Dwayne, the rock Johnson to me. I have it. It yeah. works really well. Shout out to Papa Tui. It feels great. <laughs> it's a great moisturizer. However, it's like, what about facial moisturizer says the rock, you know, like it doesn't. Yeah. And you, you know, but when he does these like ridiculous action movies, even though they're not always the greatest thing in the world, you feel they're kind of authentic because they fit the rocks milieu. They fit. Mm-hmm. And when he invests in those projects, you can at least tell, oh, he gives a shit about that. You know, like the XFL, yeah. although it's not a great football league, you're like, well, I get it. He actually cares about football. He loves the game and he wants it to succeed. Artists should be doing more of that. Artists should be going, I fucking love it. So I'm just going to do it. I would love if someone like, I'm only thinking of crazy examples with crazy money. If Taylor Swift loved a certain genre of movie, and just believed in a, a low, a low level artist in terms of their exposure. Give them five million dollars and say, "I want you to make a, a low budget movie that's straight up you. Just go do it and enjoy it." Yeah. And or, or she could just like find a filmmaker she enjoys and have him direct a music video or something. Yeah. Like, have have those interesting things to do to to go do those projects. I often think of like, it's crazy that you, that you brought that up with the Led Zeppelin, um, you know, Genesis Pink Floyd funding. I often think of if I were magically Bruce Wayne, billionaire, rich, I could just do whatever the fuck I wanted. Mm -hmm. I love dropout the streaming service. I think dropout is utterly perfect. If I had just fuck you money that I could do whatever I wanted with, I would give Sam Reich, millions of dollars and say, please go make me a feature film. What are your parameters? I don't care. Just you guys do you use the players that you guys use. Maybe get an actor or two that you've always wanted to work with, have some fun and just fuck off and make a movie because I utterly adore them and think the world of them and think they're so incredibly talented and interesting. I would love to be able to do that. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world. We live in corporate interest world. Which is why it's it's so refreshing to go back to Monty Python, where it's such a unique and weird film. <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah. Well, there's like, there's absolutely no structure. No. Like, what what's, what's the through line of this story? Like, if there was a plot... It's truly... Just the title, the the search for the Holy Grail, but it's not. Yeah, but then when they get to where they think is the Holy Grail, it's just like they just give the audience blue balls. Oh yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's just pointless, like everything else. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a very unique and interesting way to make a film. And the structure is so wild because what I love is this is the perfect example of, I don't know, they'll get it. They yeah. just, Arthur's the king. Why? Well, he wears the crown and he says he's the king. Okay. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's honestly my favorite part of the movie is when he's trying to talk those peasants into why he's king. <laughs> I that is such a smartly written section. Oh, like it's so good. I, the the dialogue in that I would challenge any academic to come up with a way of saying that in a more smart way than they said it in this. <laughs> 
I don't think you can. I really don't. Like they, yeah, the guys who wrote that are clearly so educated and smart. It's kind of crazy that they're comedians. Well, that's the thing I've always found really interesting and fascinating is people always. I don't. Want, that's too generalized. But there are many people who think comedy is as fun. Like it's the thing that in, in which when you're the funny person in a group magically there's those uneducated people of comedy that say oh you should be a comedian and you're like that's not how it works like i can be fun like having done a couple nights of stand up in my life it's fucking hard it's not easy to do you have to and you you have to dedicate yourself and be a very good writer you have to really have a through line in what you're doing and then going to open mic nights and doing competitions and things of that nature in which you can tell who's trying to approach this as a craft and who's just saying, who's been told, oh, you're the, you're so funny, you should try it. And then they get up there yeah. and they're a train wreck and they just kind of drivel over and over and over again because it's not as simple as, well, you're funny. It's like, yeah, there's so many people that are incredibly funny conversationally or they're like your group wild card that just says some wild shit because they're, they're over sharers yeah. and they're hilarious. I'm not taking anything away from all those people across the world. We all have those people in our yeah. lives, but that doesn't magically make them entertainment level across the world. Comedians. Yeah. You need to have well, a we- huge amount of intelligence to write comedy at that level and that's why it's yeah. so interesting and fascinating that's why almost all the most successful podcasts in the, on the planet are led by comedians because they're incredibly fun yeah. and intelligent cerebral people yeah and uh, like the best way I would say to compare it is like compare it to a modern day Seth Rogen comedy where like is it funny? Yeah, pro- it's probably funny. But is it always smart? Usually, no. It's usually kind of, kind of dumb. Yeah. Like, I would say, like, Super Bad. I actually think is actually a really smart and fun movie. Okay. But like, like this is the end. You remember that movie? With oh, I love Franco this is the end. Him. I love this is the end. It's a great movie. Yeah, we're like, we're like. Th- the devil at the end just has a huge sling, uh, sling and penis. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like that's the joke. Right. And then when you compare it, to, and then you compare it to this where like every line sounds like it's out of a, like a political speech. And yet it's a still written political, speech. a well-written political speech. That's also hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, I, I have one line. Yeah. I have down. Yeah, <laughs> strange women in palm. Strange women living in palms. Yes, <laughs> like <laughs> some watery, <laughs> some watery pink through it. Scimitar at me. They'd lock me away. It's just the amount of absurdity mixed with pure intelligence on real political commentary is a true gift of writing. That is incredibly hard yeah. to do. Yes, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. <laughs> like, that is such a academic way of writing that. Yes. It, it's, it, it's hilarious. It's the kind of thing in which in no way, shape, or form was I, am, am I as good of a writer as they were in this film. But it's the kind of thing in which no one is being in an academic setting and you have that you have that thing in you where you're like, this is so boring. I got to liven up. I got to liven up some of this writing. And I remember like trying to write things of that milieu where I was like, I need people to laugh because that's the tone that's going to make me succeed mm-hmm. because that's going to actually get my message out because that's how who I am. I'm not someone who's going to sit down and read a textbook or read a book and then just distribute information. That's not me. I need to have a comedic edge to me. Otherwise, I'm just like, I just kind of glaze over and go, okay. 
whatever. And those are the kind of lines that you that you're like striving for at all times as a writer because they're just so successful at telling your message while also yeah. having so much fun. Yeah, well like the not to just talk about that one joke, but like the joke of it is King Arthur is king because he was given a sword by a woman in a lake. There are so many ways, different ways you could do that joke. Oh yeah. And the way they did it is like yeah, like a political speech kind of line. Like not many people would choose that way of going about it. No. And it's a brilliant way to do it because it immediately sets you apart. And it's Yeah. I think one of the best things that this movie does, it goes back to that layered approach, is you first laugh at the absurdity of it. And then you laugh because you're like, isn't it It's so smart that they're just taking the piss out of Arthur. And then even when you're, even when you're watching it for the 15th time and you're not laughing as hard the first time, but you're still laughing for a new reason because you're like, how fucking smart is it? To place this like really intelligent political commentary around the idea of a myth that makes zero yeah. sense. <laughs> like it's perfect. And it's such a nice layered approach yeah. to it. Yeah, it's a good way of pointing out the ridiculousness of all the mythology of um ancient Britain. Yeah. Arthurian legend is, is certainly very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like the missing legends class, all the shit you learn there. Yeah, like it is all ridiculous. Oh, it, it's all it's all very interesting, unique tales, and then you have to like play with it a little bit, and that's why you just have to take the piss out of it. It's a, it, it's certainly like the I I took a myth and legend course in in college, and when we got to do creative work, that was always the time that everyone just like kind of perked up and felt really engaged because then you finally got to do a little bit of commentary in your own way about how absurd mm -hmm. all this shit that we just covered for four months was. And it wasn't just, yeah. it, isn't that kind of crazy? It's like, no, I'm going to go after that. Like <laughs> now it's my turn to say what I want about this myth. And I'm going to take every opportunity to throw shade where I can. And I absolutely yeah. adore that approach. Um, the tone just keeps going so well. Like another one that I, I love how in depth some of the dialogue can be, and then how literal some of the the dialogue can be. Because in the next scene, we have we have Eric Idle, you know, just hitting a pot, going, "Bring out your dead," and then it <laughs> ends. I love the ending of that sequence. He's like, "Must be a king. Why? Because he don't have shit all over him." And it's just like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's just so smart where that's also great art direction that's great set decoration everything looks bad and that's also yeah. going back to your other point of cinematography brilliant brilliant cinematography in which everything looks stereotypical horrible medieval and then this mm -hmm. one shining knight comes through yeah. and highlights everything about his character and it's so perfect it's yeah, so the, perfect the thought, I, the thought I had when I saw like all the castles I was like if you're making a modern movie that's in the medieval period if you're not going to Britain you're just like that's like the dumbest thing you can do it, it literally has the perfect production design already built for you like you don't need green screens. You don't need anything. It's already built. All you need to do is go to the location and shoot. Well, at the very least, you need to scout it and recreate it perfectly. Because, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of those places in which I don't know if it's actually safe to be in them. Like, one or two people can go through and kind of film and photograph and whatever. But to get a full film production in there is probably not the safest idea. Sure. But, but your, your but point is like perfect. It stands perfect. You should go there. And do as much on location as you can. It makes it feel real. 
the the location work is so important to give authenticity to your film. Yeah, and um, one of the things when you uh, look up the locations, because I was looking at all the pictures of the castles, is they use every single, like all four sides of the castles in different scenes. So, so they use it, yeah, they just use everything so efficiently. Because usually castles don't look the same on all sides. No, they don't. And people think it's just as simple as a four a four sided box. Yeah. And that's not really castle design. I, I think going to your point so much about it is use those locations to your advantage. It sets you in that time period. If it's safe to do it, you should be doing it. I look at a modern context in in two ways. I look at the uh, Battle of Winterfell in Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Although it is bothersome in some way, shape, or forms, it certainly sets a tone when you're in that medieval setting. They clearly did their homework, and we're like, it's mm-hmm. not that bright here. It's not going to be that bright. We can't have a battle at night and magically just be like, yeah. we can see everything. And as obnoxious as it is, as it might be, I remember watching it for a second time and going, you know... It's lit better than I thought it was. I can see a lot more than I thought. Yeah. It's just it's such it's, a stark contrast from what I'm used yeah. to. Yeah. Also, just this is a whole different thing, but streaming is never going to it's always going to have compression issues. Yeah. So if you can get it on Blu-ray or 4K because I watched the last season again on Blu-ray and it looks 10 times better. Interesting. And the same deal is I look at another modern context to show the importance of location and mystique. Look at the the sequel trilogy of Star Wars that Disney produced. The most compelling location, the thing that makes you feel the most like Star Wars, is Octo, where Luke's on the island by himself. That's yeah, because it's because so it's authentic. Place. It's a natural setting. It's a real place that is incredibly isolating. They could only send, by law and protection, only 50 people could be on the island at one time. And so it, it, oh, yeah. so it really served their story well. And it, But more importantly, it made it... It had this natural, wild feel to it in which you felt you were going to somewhere that was mysterious, that was different from everything else. And that aspect, if you're going to do that level of story, if you're going to have that element of story in it, that was genius. And Monty Python does that in spades, using these castles to yeah. their advantage. It's, um, I would say the closest movie to this movie in terms of production design, it, obviously it doesn't look as glossy because it has probably like one tenth the budget, but it, it's pretty comparable to Braveheart, actually. I was thinking Braveheart too. Both, yeah, both shot in Scotland, mo- the majority at least, and it's like these beautiful castles, these beautiful like rolling hills of Scotland and mountains of Scotland. Yeah, like it, it, you don't need anything else. It's just beautiful landscapes and scenery. You don't. Yeah, the the thing with the modern film is because so much can be done on green screen because so much can be done in studio at an efficient rate. Location shooting is going the way the Dodo and very rarely, if ever do people actually get to go on location anymore. And it's such a, it's such a shame because you lose that tangibility. I understand computers are getting there and it's more efficient and you can move so much quicker. You don't have to deal with the elements, but I look back at, I can't even imagine what it was like shooting Monty Python with half the mists of Scotland going through these forests and going through these rolling hill areas near lakes where there's just mist everywhere because of of the Marine layers and everything else that you're dealing with. Right. And then you watch like a behind the scenes of a modern film that has to do like two location shots. And they're like, 
oh, it was raining so bad, and we just didn't know if we were going to get the shot. And you're like, you, you're touting yourself as heroes for having to deal with two minutes of real film. Yeah. Right? Well, I think, yeah, this is getting too much into the weeds, but, like, I just don't think modern filmmakers handle, like, wrenches getting thrown into the situation that well anymore. Or maybe it's... Because it's so easy. It's so easy to have perfect conditions now. Right. So... It's the same deal. I, I mean, we're getting really off topic here, but it's the same reason why I can't stand the modern push of of stadiums to go the way of going indoors because then, well, you always have perfect conditions then. I'm like, that's not the point of football. The point of football is you're playing outside and that's part of the game. And yeah. And it's always something I have to, when new stadiums are built, always going, Oh, well, they're putting a dome on that one. That goes that great stadium experience and a location that's built with weather into it creates such a vast environment of rich tapestry for you to play with. And when you don't take advantage of it and you have perfect things, it doesn't look great. Or even if it does look great, it it doesn't feel tangible. There's a reason that even the mat shots in Empire Strikes Back look phenomenal. Beyond the fact that ILM did a great job is... They gave you that tangibility in Scandinavia where it was cold as fuck. You could clearly see all the snow just drifting in the wind and you could tell it was real by shooting it. And then when you had to go and do miniature work, not in location, but on a set and you had to replicate that, you bought it and you believed it because you were given the tangibility to it. Yeah. And, and well, to bring it back to this, bring so, it back to this movie. Do you have a favorite? Location, in terms of one of the scenes. Oh, if I'm going strictly location, I love the forest in which Galahad is wandering, trying to find that castle with the Grail Beacon. I think that works so well. I think that looks beautiful. Same thing with the sequence with the knights who say "ne." I love that misty forest vibe. That looks so, mm -hmm. so good. Well, that's a that's another um, scene that has some real deal filmmaking in it. Like that's some real tension building when they're like doing these quick cuts of the people just in the mist. Yeah, it's fun. Well, I, I think what's super interesting is this would be a really I don't know niche topic, but it doesn't have an outward appeal, but it's so important. <laughs> is I would love to go back and do an analysis of how we got so many of these modern, so many things that we associate with big budget stuff that actually got it from low budget things that just had to be creative. It's something that Spielberg's talked about, something that Lucas has talked about. So many, so many horror filmmakers have talked about this is when you don't have a lot of money, it forces you to get incredibly creative. Yeah. You can't get, you don't get to do the, you know, you don't get to do that. Well, there was an army of 500 people. So we shot 500 people yeah. in costume. And, and you also don't get to do the, we'll fix it in post kind of thing. Yeah. You have to make the best of the situation possible. And in the in the sequence with the knights who say knee, building that tension, that's probably one person just running back and forth between trees, <laughs> and probably. you're and you're splice cutting it with this incredibly tense music. The music in this film does not get enough credit for giving stakes in a movie that has no stakes. It's incredible, mm -hmm. and the way in which it's spliced up and cut is utterly gorgeous. And brings a lot to the table. <laughs> yeah, I maybe I got a little too lofty with one of my notes, but I I wrote down this is kind of more in the mold of like Mel Brooks's The Producers and Duck Soup by the Marx Brothers and stuff, where it's like 
actually more of a satire than it is just a broad comedy. It might be. Because most of the scenes are commenting on some kind of classism, but that is quite lofty for what this movie actually is. I don't think it's wrong, though. I, I, I just think it's done in such a unique way that it's hard to see it that way. It's 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 comparing a player that's playing in a new era and you, and they they dominate yeah. but they they do it in a different way than anyone. It's like getting Steph Curry when he's first just draining three after three after three and the threes were part of an accent game, not the entire thing of that not the entire court like standard of someone's game. It's yeah. You know, it's the running quarterback when we only had pocket passers. It's it's the it's the Star Wars where they have no opening credits and they just blast right into a movie compared to those movies in which credits were they had to be up front, you had to do it a certain way. It's such mm-hmm. an interesting and unique way way to do things. Um and it's just doing it in a different fashion than you're used to where every scene in this movie has quality writing and quality jokes and physical performances and satires usually have at least a couple scenes in which it's very serious. There's no joke. It's we're yes, we're setting up. It's the classic comedy and tragedy are intertwined at all times. We need to have a little Mm -hmm. bit of tragedy. So the comedy works really well. They don't do that here but it still has all the traditional satire beats of commenting yeah. on real world things. Yeah. The only most satires do, but the two I said, and then like, um, the great dictator with Charlie Chaplin, those are three that really avoid it. Like this movie where like, they don't get serious really. No, <laughs> they're, they're not going to take themselves seriously. They're going to stick to what they know, which is comedy. Right. Which I appreciate. I, I I do as well because if, it's, it's. If you don't want to get it's it's kind of like the Seinfeld thing where like if you don't want to get heartfelt, then don't. Who cares? No, you have to. That's that's part of the beauty is when you're focused strictly on the comedy. When you're fi- when you're focused strictly on the task at hand, which is making people laugh, and you're good at it, you. You create a timeless piece of art that stands up even when it's completely out of date. Where mm-hmm. Part of the reason that I always argue... I'm glad you brought up Seinfeld. Seinfeld is an, a show in which I always argue it's the greatest television show of all time. Because it's so socially relevant... Because everyone's like, oh, they're talking about all these old 90s things and all these old 80s, like late 80s, early 90s. And it's of its time, certainly. You can't say it's not of its time. But the things they're actually discussing, the things they're actually using comedy to express their opinion on are all social elements that happen in everyday life. In which you can go back and you can just go, okay, so they're watching The English Patient. Who gives a shit if they're watching The English Patient from the 90s? They're commenting on stuff that's still happening today. Yeah, exactly. The examples are contemporary, but you can substitute it with something from now. And it's brilliant in the way it does that. This does the exact same thing, in which I love seeing the modern sequences, or modern, when they're telling modern-day 70s (laughs) stuff in this. Yeah. And you're seeing, like, the professor, and he just gets his head chopped, and you're like, the (laughs) fuck?! And you're seeing yeah, 70s fashion. You're seeing 70s um, documentarian filmmaking <laughs> mixed in with this absurd comedy. What? Well, um, one of the things I love to do when, like, like I don't want to commit to watching a full movie. I'll look up YouTube reactions of the movies. So it's only like 40 minutes, but it's still covering the whole movie. Yeah, it's the highlights and, too. Yeah. And every every single reaction to that part where the historian just gets his neck slit is so funny because it's so random and it is like so confusing. 
but it's hilarious how people are like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yes. I, I think that's where... I think if we're really going to do justice to talking about this movie, it's it's in the layering of comedy. You have, yeah. you have level one, which is the absurd physical comedy, which is yeah. none better. I still do not believe I've seen a a better scene a better scene to make someone laugh. No scene in my life has ever made me laugh more than the Black Knight scene has. The ability for that scene to just be fucking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason it's iconic. In which you have the first level of absurd physical comedy. Then it mixes with great dialogue. Then you start picking up that extra level of stuff where when you're seeing Patsy's reactions and the first time you're watching it, you're like, why are you cutting away from the, why are you cutting away from the shot? But then when you get Patsy reacting to stuff, it makes it that much more enriching because Patsy is you in that moment. You're watching that film. And then you get the underlying stuff of he's protecting a bridge that's three feet wide (laughs) on a river that's four feet wide. (laughs) Like, what the fuck are we doing? Why is he immediately in this place? Why is he immediately confrontational for no reason? And then you have to look at this not very well choreographed (laughs) (laughs) on perp, but intentionally not well choreographed fight sequence that happens right after a brutal brawl that completely yeah. takes the myth- mysticism out of knights, in which, like, when you first think of knights, you think of the romanticism and oh, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking this emblem into battle and I'm representing more than myself. I'm representing yeah. my house and my family and my kingdom, and I fight with chivalry. honor and my sword, chivalry. And then it's just two guys beating the shit out of each other, like throwing <laughs> elbows, throwing forearms, throwing punches. Just trying to do really ridiculous overhand strikes. And then to end that sequence prior to Arthur fighting by chucking his sword through the slit of the guy's helmet is so absurd. And one of the best shots I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I lo- And I love how, like, how janky it looks when they're fighting, like, the sword barely touches the knight's arm and it just falls off and <laughs> yes. starts spewing blood. It's just like, <laughs> that's the best part about it is like, you can see the level of low budget filmmaking. Yeah. Which as, yeah. like, as someone who we used to make low, real, zero budget. <laughs> zero budget is as, very important. Yeah. As, as kids, like, that's the stuff that makes me really laugh. It's, that's that's the point of comedy. You don't need these over the top two hundred million dollar budgets to make great comedy. Comedy's in the ingenuity and comedy's in the moment. <laughs> the fact that, like what I really love is again those understated bits when you're looking at the choreography. Obviously, I love when he's just chopping limbs off. I think that's fucking hilarious. But I love when he just he's blocking the sword with his sword. And you're looking and you're like, why would he even attempt that move? It It's not even going to gain him anything. And Arthur's yeah. literally just like, he's essentially protecting his ankle. And then he does the mm-hmm. same move and you're like, what is the what is the Black Knight trying to accomplish here? And then Arthur every time is just like, just kind of like, and this, but there's great character work in the facial shots. Again, the cinematography is great in that, in which it gets the comedy across, but then it gets great character building where you're seeing those facial shots of Arthur and he just looks so smug and confident, like, yeah, stop. Just stop, please. I'm better than you. We all know I'm better than you. Please just stop. And, oh, tremendous. Toe is but a scratch. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that scene is, like, iconic. It's always going to be funny, no matter what age you are. Yeah. Like, that's the reason. I think that's probably why we liked it as kids, was because of that scene. Oh, yeah. Because it's perfect. You can understand it when you're five years old. 
Oh yeah. And you still understand why it's funny. <laughs> the comedy works on when comedy is done right, it works for everybody. There's just something about it that makes mm-hmm. you laugh. And it, there's just so much fun in that sequence. And then to get the dialogue mixed in, it's just a flesh wound. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, running away, eh? You yellow bastard. <laughs> and it's like. It's so fun just to just get that. Or or I, I love when he has no limbs left. He's like, alright, we'll call it a draw. And you're like, in what world do you believe that this is a draw? You were in medieval times and you would no longer have limbs. In which way is this a draw? And, yeah. and the character building of the Black Knight to have such an ego. And another thing, the Black Knight is something... In legend, you don't even have to know true legends of Black Knights or anything. You know just from all the modern tellings and retellings of myth that, oh shit, the Black Knights, legit. Like, Mm -hmm. they're awesome. And the fact that they have the Black Knight, they win a fight as a brawler with ingenuity, and then just get the shit kicked out of them, is immediately goes back to that, it's, there's such a unifying tie of, we're taking the piss out of everything. Anything that's sacred, it's fucking dead. Let's kill it all and yeah. let's just have some fun. Um, yeah. And I love those. I love those sequences. I think other sequences that I just have to comment on is I love the absurdity of every scene, but specifically the next scene in which they're bringing a witch to Bedivere. And Bedivere is being the scientific mind behind this. Yeah. And there's no logic whatsoever of any sound thought. And yet, it's just like... Yeah. <laughs> it's so much well, fun. The, the, thing about, the thing about that scene is... I don't even understand... Are they making that myth about witches up? <laughs> about, like, them being made of wood and stuff i think so because like i had never that's so random that i'm like i've never heard that before no so i'm like is this just some random shit they just said on the set so they just went with it i have no idea and then again great cinematography in the mob sequence to get to bedivere where like you can tell real anger of these um of these townsfolk it's tremendous i noticed something i've never seen and i have seen this movie 15 20 times there's a there's an extra in the in the crowd and he has shaving cream for a beer <laughs> it's hilarious i was like oh my god how have i never noticed this <laughs> Because it's like it's like a shot of three people, and he's the one in the middle in the back. <laughs> it's so funny. I was like, "How have I never noticed that?" Before? Again, it, so it goes. It goes to. I've never noticed that. I'm glad you pointed it out because I'm gonna rewatch it now just to see, yeah. just to see it. But it goes back to that, like the ingenuity, and when you yeah. when you don't have rules, it's a really liberating place to be in. <laughs> <laughs> And the fact that they're just like, what if we just put this guy with shaving cream and see what would happen? And <laughs> it's like, you, you get away with it. It's kind of like how animators will sneak shit into into cartoons from back in the day. Or how everyone always yeah. has these theories of like sexual stuff put into Disney movies. You can see sex in the clouds. It's kind of like, yeah, all that shit. That's the most uh, like outwardly facing. We're just going to slap the audience in the face and see if they notice. But, but one of the, the thing I love about it is like, you have to have real restraint to not like show that off, you know? Like they just hit it in the background of a shot. They don't call it out or anything. It's just there if you notice it. Again, it, it speaks to the intelligence of them as as writers, producers, yeah. directors, cinematographers, in which they have the the restraint to not do it. It it's something yeah. in which. It's another thing when we're commenting on these older films and then we're comparing them to new film is 
it feels like there's no restraint anymore in a positive way. Yeah. Restraints are only in things that it feels like when they need more restraint, they have no restraint. And when they should have the license to do whatever they want, that's when they're like, oh, let's scale it back. And yeah. It's something in which I topical because it just came out in the last couple of days. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I saw an interview with Michael Keaton in which he said, "I want." Oh, no, sorry, Michael Douglas. Oh yeah, my apologies. He's going to be Michael Keaton forever. Um, I know, I know. You can't go back now. <laughs> like you're Michael I, Keaton. I know. You're I Michael Keaton. Funny. Um, in which. In the interview, he said, I don't want to do any more than maybe one more minute as Beetlejuice in the film. I don't want this movie to just turn into all Beetlejuice, because that's exactly when things go wrong. I don't. I haven't watched the movie, I don't know the quality of the film yet, but I love that thought process where he's like, I can, I understand, we're doing a sequel, people are excited, and I was... Mm-hmm. As the titular character, I was the highlight of the old movie. But the old movie doesn't focus on Beetlejuice that much. You actually don't yeah. see Beetlejuice that much. And the fact that he's just like, let's not overdo this. Let's just, you know, let's make sure I'm in it enough and maybe a little bit extra to serve that master, but we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's good restraint. And and that's a level of restraint in which so many people making film today do not have. And your sequence is perfect in discussing that, in which they didn't highlight it. They just threw it in the background of a transitional shot. And it's never talked yeah, about no again. One's, no one's even talking in the shot either. Yeah. It's just a reaction shot. It's so good. It's great. It's so smart. I also love the line when, uh, when the guy's like, she turned me into a newt. And then everyone turns to him. I got better. <laughs> yeah. John Cleese. John Cleese is brilliant. In when I look at this I film, John Cleese is such a fucking curmudgeon, though. Like he, even then, he was a curmudgeon. In the interviews, <laughs> in the interviews, he comes off as such a fucking asshole. The, the guy's like, "So what's the worst thing about uh, working on this movie?" He's like, "Oh, these interviews." <laughs> he's just like such a curmudgeon about everything like I always heard about him being a curmudgeon um, like in his older age but I'm like no he's always been like that he just grew into he just grew to the age that he's always been yes. it's very yeah. much it's very much that thing the ability I think all the principal actors are tremendous but when I look at what's really carrying this film for me, I I always look at the performances of John Cleese, Eric Idle, and Terry Gilliam. Those are the three oh, that see, I I Michael Palin's my MVP. He's he's great, but I think because he's the outward only one that actually has like consistency, and I guess changes in character. Where he's not just always noble author. Yeah. Well, he plays like 17 different characters or something like that. Oh, yeah. My my favorite character in the film that he does is the silent hiccuping guard. That's my favorite. (laughs) That's just so much fun. Um, But I, I look at... I love the transitional pieces that Eric Idle does. I think Eric Idle gets to have the most fun in this movie... In terms of if you ask me, okay, you have to take you have to take one of those actors' places in this movie and you get to play everybody they'd play, I'd be like, I probably am gonna pick Eric Idle. To play the cowardly knight, who then also tries to take advantage of every situation to make it seem as though he's not cowardly. Plus he gets to play the shrubber, plus he gets to play Brother Maynard, who also has a really fun sequence in this film. And, you know, he gets to play the guy taking out all the dead bodies on the cart. Just the absurdity of all those different pieces, so much fun. It, however, yeah. John Cleese getting to play Tim the Enchanter would be really fun. <laughs> Tim the Enchanter's great. Tim the Enchanter's one of the best parts, and I love how they're like, what if we had a pyrotechnics budget and we blew it all in one scene? <laughs> yeah, that's probably, that probably was their entire bu- budget for that effect. <laughs> they did it, dude. I 
can't think of another effect at all, actually. All their effects are animation. And yeah, yeah, because the god, the god who speaks to the clouds is just a still photo. Yeah. Of I think it was like a famous cricket player or something like that. <laughs> of course it was. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, they didn't have much of a budget for effects. But again, great location scene. That look that scene that looks beautiful. To this day, that thing looks beautiful. With Tim out fun. Tim's out in the in the distance standing on oh, the yes, peak yes. and then he appears. That's a beautiful shot in the mountains. That's another one where I'm like, ooh, that might take it. It's just like it's just kind of just a beautiful landscape where I think atmospherically I like the mm-hmm. I like the sequences in the mistier forest. Um I'd well, be that's like a, that's like a straight up Lord of the Rings location. Very much it so. It, it it is utterly gorgeous to look at. The only other sequences I, I think we really need to talk about. I love the entire sequence of Galahad being tempted by all the women in that castle by themselves. Mm-hmm. It's so smart because also knowing some knowing the history behind that character, Galahad is always the pure one. He's the one that oh, will really? stick to the Galahad is purity. That's what his whole thing is. And so reason he's like, okay. Oh, I'm, Ga- I'm Sir Galahad, the chaste. Like he is incorruptible. And in that sequence, I love how much they really try to get him to stay that way. And then finally he just goes, ah! Morals. Yeah. And then you got John Cleese running in, saving the day like he always does. <laughs> exactly. But really, but really not saving the day. <laughs> yeah, and I just love the absurdity of all of those beautiful young women mm-hmm. all just being isolated and horny and just wanting a man around simply because yeah. he's a man. I love that sequencing because, A, it's ridiculous. But there is some weird truth to it. It's got, like, that weird bachelorette party vibe where all of a sudden, like... yeah. When you see clips of a bachelorette party and all you can, like, you can see how women just kind of turn the switch off and they're like, I'm not going to hate men for this second. I'm just going to, I'm just going to enjoy the absurdity of it. It has that to it, but then it also has really smart character work in it in which, and great dialogue where every character is named something fucking stupid. Of course. And then they get meta in which, oh, do you think we should have cut this scene? And then they're commenting on, oh, it's just a bunch of pussy jokes for, <laughs> like, the yeah. entire sequence. But at the same time, it's so smart because it's, it's, show, it's, it's self-aware that it's a ridiculous premise. Yes. And actually, there's fourth wall breaks within fourth wall breaks. Because there's fourth wall breaks from other storylines speaking to other storylines. <laughs> yes. It's so weird. I just thought about that right now. Like, it, it is not many people would do that. It's tremendous, and it also goes to another level of comedy in which they do the absurd physical comedy. They do the, they do the really smart dialogue, and then they go to very baseline sex jokes that are just like are gonna make you yeah. laugh. They have something for everybody, and that's what I really love. And the only other sequence I think I really just love is not even necessarily the sequence itself it's hard to write a better sequence than the tale of sir lancelot (laughs) where he's just murdering fools but it's the whole the the prince dialogue with his father and then the the dialogue of (laughs) of the father with the guards is so british comedy at its finest yeah i love i love when he's trying to break into song that's hilarious. <laughs> and then Michael Palin is just like, no, nope, we're not doing that shit. We, we're not going to write a song for this fucking movie, so no, we're not doing a musical number right now. Right. Although they did do, they did do Camelot, I guess. And I think one of the best shots in the movie is that establishing shot of Lancelot running to the castle. In which it's, it's the oh, guard... The heavy drums, 
It's just the heavy drums, oh, yeah. and then he's just running closer and closer, and the guards just like no one cares, and he just keeps getting closer, and this dramatic music, and cuts back, cuts back to him with dramatic music running, and then it's just all right. I'm just gonna murder everyone. I'm not gonna ask any questions. I'm gonna save the princess by just murdering yeah. everybody <laughs> with some of the worst sword work I've ever seen. Where he's like, huzzah, ha 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 ha. And you're like, <laughs> Yeah. What are you doing, man? <laughs> yeah, he... That's probably... That was always my favorite sequence. But, like I said before, that one where King Arthur's trying to talk to the peasants is now my new favorite. Yeah, I, I, I guess one of the only flaws I could see in this film is, I think, on rewatch, the first act is the best act. The... I would agree. It has the best dialogue interactions. It has the best physical comedy. No matter what, the Black Knight's the best scene in the movie. Bar none. I, I don't think you can get better than that. Not Maybe because I've seen it too much, but... I just look at it, it on so many levels, it works. Where I will say, as someone who who was younger watching this for the first time, those scenes don't work as well that you that you were speaking to. Which, oh, yes, for sure. And now I love them, and they're tremendous, and I laugh at them. But if you're not in the right place to absorb some of those scenes, where it's strictly all dialogue, mm-hmm. until that last end, where he's like, you know, when he just says, bloody peasant, he's just like, help, help, I'm being repressed. Outside of that yeah. moment, you see that? You hear that? That's what I'm on about. You see him repress oh, <laughs> When I was 10 years old, I did not understand any of that scene. Yeah, and I'm not saying, obviously, I don't think Holy Grail is meant for a 10-year-old. But no, I think when we're talking about the timelessness of this movie, how it works on so many levels for so many different age groups, I think that can be put into play a little bit when you're talking about what's the scene, where I don't care how old you are, I don't care who you are, what background in life, no matter what, the Black Knight's fucking funny. It's just Mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to show your kid any scene from the movie, that's the one I would pick. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like, universally funny. It's what... It's also one that you could show someone who doesn't speak English, and they would still understand it. Yes. This is... that's That's a classic... I'm trying to impart the stuff I loved to the next generation that I that I love. And how mm-hmm. do I how do I give them that and show them how this thing that I love so much and get them to like it? It's that thing where you know we we had that rite of passage just like everybody else in which our parents showed us stuff that they loved and we ended up loving it. Or we didn't, you know? And oddly, both our parents did that in weird ways, where we didn't get that much with Mom, but Mom's like, let's watch Grease. And we're like, what? But we ended up loving Grease. You know, I remember Mom's actually one that... I remember Mom was actually the first one that showed us Goonies. And I was like, this is not a Mom movie. Like, you're usually trying to say, like, Gone with the Wind and Grease and, like, girl movies, right? And then I remember she's the one who said we're going to watch Goonies. And I was just like, what? And then falling in love with the movie. And dad did the same thing with James Bond, Indiana Jones, Star Wars. I was like, those were the things he showed us. The Black Knight is the scene where you're trying to convince someone to watch the movie. Like, just watch this scene. Just watch this scene and you'll fall in love and you'll want to watch the rest of this movie. That's the scene. Um, that I think is tremendous. Um, the only other thing I think that's really a disservice to not talk about in this movie is all the callback jokes and the understated stuff. My favorite ongoing gag in this movie is Bedivere constantly flipping his visor up because it's so poorly designed that the bars go straight in his eyes. <laughs> but yeah. yet it's wide open cage, so he should be able to see everything, and yet he can't. So it's... In essence, the worst armor, but the best costume design ever. Yeah. And at the same time, 
just the absurdity of him going, oh, it's serious. <laughs> As if the two bars being here magically yeah. changes anything. It's so good. It's so good. Some... Uh, yeah, I had a note down about the trivia somewhere about their costuming. I'm trying to find it. Oh, here it is. Um, Graham Chapman, the guy who played King Arthur. Yeah. He's the only one who's actually wearing actual chain mail. <laughs> everyone else is just wearing like fabric that is meant to look like it. So everyone else is probably wearing stuff that costs like 10 bucks probably. <laughs> and then he's actually got like full blown real deal medieval stuff. <laughs> of course of fucking yeah. course which is really smart yeah, that's a smart way of, yeah that's a good way of doing it uh, i also love the it's i just picked up on this one is they're leaving the cave and they get to the bridge of death and arthur's like scaling the walls if it's a really skinny pathway and then everyone behind him is just walking like it's a normal pathway and oh i didn't notice it's that. such a smart understated joke in which it's only you're only going to notice it if you pay attention. It's very much like the scene you brought up where there's just the guy with shaving cream for a beard. Yeah. Where if you don't catch it, you're not going to notice it. But I was looking and I was just like, oh, it's really smart. He's scaling the wall. And then everyone else is just walking like it's normal. And then Lancelot yeah. butts through like three people to get past him. So it's clearly not dangerous. But Arthur's like <laughs> scaling a yeah. wall like it's a real problem. So smart. There you go. You can notice new things every time you watch it. So smart. And it's those things that I think are just why this movie leaves such an indelible mark and why it is a a true cornerstone of of film comedy. It's yeah. so good. It's so good. Yeah. The, the only other line I wanted to call out, because I love it, is when everyone's so enchanted, they're all like, Camelot. Camelot. And then Terry Gilliam's just like, it's only a model. Yeah, I fucking <laughs> love it. I, I loved so it. Good. It's only a model. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> and it's. I love the cutaway shots that are clearly all shot at the same time from the same location, but they're used in all throughout the movie. Or like Michael Palin, a blessing, a blessing from the Lord. God be praised. Like it's just so clearly not in the scene that it's being used in. But it's just there. So much fun work by Michael Palin. Also another one that just really carries this movie. Um, with the absurdity in which he's doing some of the stuff that he is. So much fun. Yeah. I would say yeah, I would say Michael Palin definitely is the most absurd. Oh yeah, like he goes the most he goes the most out there with his characters. I love which that. Is why I, which is probably why I love him the most. They're just fun. They're just fun. He has a, actually, now that I think about it, he has a real like Dana Carvey and Master of Disguise kind of thing in this movie. Yeah, where his characters are just like so out there, and they're all they're wildly outrageous. different. Yeah. No, oh, he's he's playing the knight who says knee as the keeper. He's playing Galahad. He's very, you know, steadfast knight. Um he's playing the other monk, not Brother Maynard, where he has to <laughs> read everything and the orangutans and the da 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 and you're like yeah. wildly different stuff all the time. The, the holy hand grenade. Yeah. yeah. It it's just so And he much plays fun. the and he plays the king of the Prince Herbert and the Prince guy. And I think he plays the real unifying peasant who's trying to burn the witch. Yes, he does. <laughs> burn her! Burn her anyways! And you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, God. It's just so much fun throughout this movie. It, the, the, again, this is... You're not going to learn much from this movie from a classical sense. If you're, no. We've been doing a lot of, you know, we both stated that watching The Dark Knight is a master class in writing. Watching The Dark Knight, you can, that is perfect structure to learn. If you're going to pick up anything from this, 
It's just the idea of don't write with limitations. Just, yeah, just write don't, your idea. Don't, you're not bound to structure in comedy. No. Like, if, if you find it funny, there's a good chance someone else will find it funny. And because the Python guys have such a like uh, unified sense of what's funny, they have an immediate way of bouncing ideas off of each other, which only strengthens strengthens it. Yeah, it, it it's certainly so much. It's so much more interesting that they all have that unifying tie. And it gives this movie this unity that it really needs because it's so absurd, it's so out there with no structure, no order, just whatever. We just yeah. wanted to make something, we made it. And yet it's a great lesson in no limitation writing. It's a great lesson mm-hmm. in sometimes it's okay to go to the level that you don't think is right. Your favorite scene in this movie is not something... That's going to be written in 99 out of 100 movies. Because no one's going to get into this like class warfare idea in a comedy movie. Well, just satires aren't even made anymore, really. I mean, when's the last... I had this question earlier, but I thought I'd save it for now. As we transition towards the end. What is the last great comedy movie that was released in a theater? comedies, rom-coms, and non-franchise action films at this point are all streaming service territory now. Yeah. None of them go down the theatrical really? route. A- anyone but you was a rom-com that was successful. I wouldn't say it was particularly great. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I can't even think of a comedy that... I mean... American Fiction, that was nominated for Best Picture last year, that's a satire, but it's more of a dramedy than it is a comedy. And that's the thing is we're getting a well, lot of we're getting a lot of dramedy towards the end of yeah. end of calendar years as Oscar bait now, and mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily against good good movies or good movies, and I haven't seen American Fiction yet, but um, it, it's. We're getting a lot more of those movies, but we're not getting straight comedy in a, in a theater very often. The last era that I even think had that was kind of the heyday of Seth Rogen from 2007 yeah. to... I'd pretty much mark it at this is the end. Ironically, this is the end kind of turns into the end of that era. Because I'm... Yeah. You know, like 21 Jump Street, the reboots, and 22 Jump Street has a bit of that. But... I'm struggling to think of those movies that are strictly... We're making a comedy, and it's for a wide audience that's going to be released to a theater. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. They're they're all placed in... They're all placed into... We're seeing a lot of genre mixing of action comedy. Ironically enough, it could be argued... Of the most widespread comedy movies of the last 10 years have been Deadpool. Yeah, that's the ones I thought about. Because they're, they're the I mean, only ones that really have that. That's kind of a sad thing to me. Right, and like I love Deadpool, but I don't want every comedy to be Deadpool. I don't want... Well, I just don't... I don't want every single movie to have to mix genres now. Right. I I look I I think it's a I think it's a sad commentary when we're looking back at a lot of these movies in which to me, you know, like we we talk about Sultan. I love the 80s movies. When I look back at the 80s comedy movies, there's not a lot of genre mixing ever. It's just yeah. Hey, this is a ridiculous premise. Let's do it. Caddyshack, Stripes, uh you know, Ghostbusters has a little bit of genre mixing, but that's a comedy movie with an insane mm-hmm. premise. Uh, you you have a lot of those films. You look at all the Mel Brooks stuff in the past. You could say they're genre bending ones, 
but they're spoofs. So it's not the same thing. Yeah. Plus, Mel Brooks is his own thing. Like, that's just... That's true. That is very true. You know, I even look at... You know, the 2000s, where you're getting Step Brothers, Anchorman, Knocked Up, Superbad, things of that nature, in which it's just... What is this movie? It's a fucking comedy. Do I give a shit about yeah. newscasters in any way, shape, or form? No. But is Anchorman one of my absolute favorite comedies of all time? Yes, because it's hilarious. Mm-hmm. And it's ridiculous, and it's absurd, yeah. and it, it plays to my milieu of comedy. So it's it's the crying shame to see something like Monty Python made in 75 where it makes zero sense, has no structure, no budget, and it withstands the test of time as one of the most important films of its entire era. Yeah. Can, I just want to point out two more things that I wrote down from that interview uh, video I watched. Sure. <laughs> There's a part where Graham Chapman is in costume as like one of the random characters, and the interviewer asks, how does this fit into the movie? And then Graham's just like, oh, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't at all. Like, they're full blown, like, yeah, they know it doesn't make sense. They know it has no structure. They don't care. Yeah. It, and then, um. The absurdity of that. The absurdity of that yeah. statement is ridiculous and so honest. And then, and then the other thing I wrote down was this was advertised in Britain as an epic, which is just <laughs> a hilarious thought to have. Like, <laughs> this. <laughs> I mean, does it does it look good? Yes, but it is it is it an epic like Ben Hur or Lawrence of Arabia? <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> no. Well, that, that's the other thing. It goes back to the efficiency of this movie. It it one of the things I adore about it is it it takes me back and gives me the warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feelings of watching those five bu- five minute no budget movies you used to make with all of our friends, in which. Yeah. Almost every scene is three people, four people. There's no, you know, the peasants, there's a lot of extras, but it's three, four people is the focus, right? Yeah. Even still, that the, the sequence of the political talk we keep going back to, it's four characters and someone in the background. That's it. And it's all the same people constantly doing the same things or constantly playing different characters. It feels very much as that heartfelt group of people that you're like, God, I want it to, I want them to make it because it'd be fun to see them do it. And it's such an enjoyable thing to see when it happens. It's so brilliant. Mm-hmm. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. So what are our questions for uh, Cult Classics? Oh, Cult Classics, it's more so this. is. It's not so much questions as, would you recommend this film to somebody? Hundred percent, and is I we really don't have much question about cult classic. It's like, more so it, just enjoying it. Does it deserve its status? I guess. Yes, that's right? the only other real question that I, wholeheartedly it does. I just the only thing I'd say on that is like I hope that it maintains its status. Oh, it will. Like I hope I hope the generation after us still really loves it because i don't know if they have discovered it yet really well the, one of the reasons that i said it's one of the most important movies of its era is because it's found it's become so influential understatedly and it already has found its place in history you know spam a lot mm-hmm. is even if you've never gone to Spamalot, you know what Spamalot is. You know the premise behind getting to Spamalot. You know... You know the importance of this movie without even knowing it. And then to, yeah. and then to and, get it... And you, see, and you see internet memes of it and, all the time. Right, and it's gone into meme culture, it's gone into gif culture, it's gone into so many... So many 
modern pieces of media that it's already found its mark. It can't be undone. Mm-hmm. I, it, there are movies that I remember they were big when we were kids that I've heard of them. I knew of that movie. And then now I look and I'm like, I don't know if people really know this movie anymore, at least of our generation yeah. stuff where every generation has those movies that they grew up thinking, Oh, that's such a big movie. And then they're not, I'm, yeah, preview to our Oscar um, episode in which there's a lot of movies that at the time I know the names they seem like big movies no one talks about them ever again mm-hmm. whereas I couldn't yeah. t- what is the best picture winner of 1975 One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest okay that's a pretty damn good movie people still know that movie 75 is actually like a really strong year so I'll give it to them in that year but like just like even it just making two point five million dollars, I, I it would make like, I think a crazy amount of money nowadays. If that was released, I would hope it. if I that would was hope. released as is, every shot is just cleaned up in terms of digitally. It looks good, four K, mm-hmm. and you don't change anything about it except the quality of the the actual film itself. Yeah. Of what it shot on. I think this could easily make $200 million. Easily. Because I... I would hope so. Because this is the kind of movie that gets released and has an okay first day budget or okay first day opening or first weekend opening where it makes $10 million and they're already like, oh, it's successful. It made its money back and and whatever. But people... This is the this is the kind of movie that has legs where two, three, four, five weeks go by, and it's still eking money out, and then it hits a streaming platform, and they re-release it because it's so popular on a streaming platform. Yeah. Yeah. I just hope it stays relevant. It, it will. It certainly will. And it it is the cult classic of cult classics. It... Not everyone's going to tell you, go watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But the people who do, it holds a very special place in their heart. Uh, yeah. And it deserves all the recognition in the world. I think it's utterly phenomenal. Um, and a great movie to go watch. So everyone should go check yep. that out. Just like you should go check out this word for some sponsors quick. Boom. But thank you guys so much for watching the show. It has been a ton of fun going back to yesteryear watching Monty Python and Holy Grail with you all. We're going to Oscars pretty soon, which is going to be fun. Next week on the show, we are rewriting Batman vs. Superman, which yeah. Dylan and I both have have written or are writing at least scene maps. Not word for word, but scene maps to get... the. You the idea yeah, of our of our Batman vs Superman, which is going to be fun again, and we have a lot of good stuff coming up as we're moving September into October with a lot of Halloween themed uh, movies and other things that we can't wait for you guys to watch and get used to. Thank you guys so much for watching the Wisco Movie Watchers podcast or listening on Spotify. We appreciate you. Go follow us where you can. Check out our Etsy shop and check out the rest of our content. Peace, love, and hugs to you all. Go watch a great movie. Bye! I hear you guys are really liking PT Creative's content. And you know what? You should! Because it's pretty rad. You may even want to support the channel even more. Well, there's a way you can do it and reward yourself. And that's by going to our Etsy shop. Head on over to PTE Creative's Etsy shop and you can find all kinds of cool merch like you see on screen. You may be watching some of our Pokemon themed content and going, ah, I'd love some merch there. You can do that. You can even get our custom Fakemon stickers right there, or stickers of existing Pokemon, t-shirts, or mystery packs. But you may be saying, huh, I don't know if Pokemon's maybe my vibe. You know what? That's fine, because we got all kinds of fun, snarky millennial content and sports-related things over at the Etsy shop as well. You maybe got some big bench warmer energy that you just got to spread with the world. Or maybe you just need to tell people that you hope both teams are having fun as they're playing because it's just all about vibes to you and you hate to see it. You hate to see it. 
if you didn't get your merch. You can go get that merch right here, right now. Head on over to Etsy. Go to etsy.com slash shop slash P-T-E creative and go get yourself some awesome merch and go support a local content creator in this community we call the internet. Hope y'all see some great merch coming soon from Etsy. Go to PT Creative on Etsy and get yourself some great merch. No! Hey friends, I know you're enjoying this show, but we want to prime you for a new show. Go check out. Go check out the weekly schedule over at PT Creative and find your new favorite podcast or show to watch. Monday and Thursday, you get the Far Out Football Podcast with news, analysis, and notes of the NFL season, plus great projects during the offseason like draft analysis and what if questions like what if the nfl expanded tuesday go to the onetta show for absurd takes and fun all around the topics in entertainment gaming movies television you name it onetta show is going to talk about it wednesday you can go check out the pokemon bliss and oblivion project in which new pokemon are being designed every single week as we create the halzari fakey region. Friday, it's kind of a fun laid back day over at PT Creative. You can go open some brand new Pokemon card packs or get some new specials and seasonal content coming your way on a Friday. And finish your week out with the Wisco Movie Watchers podcast on Saturdays. Get great movie recommendations, learn some movie history, and just have a grand old time listening to some dialogue. It's going to be a whole heck of a lot of fun over on Saturdays, just like it is every single day over at PTE Creative. Go check out New podcasts, new content, new shows every single Monday through Saturday over at PTE Creative. Now enjoy the rest of your show.